Now this might actually be the last of our chi-squared and categorical hypothesis test ver um, videos. It's going to probably be somewhat long and, in, and a little tedious, but I don't intend for you to just plow through it. I'm hoping that you watch this. There's a few examples I work through. I'm hoping that you watch this, you stop it, you work through the example, you check and see whether you got the right answer, if not where you went wrong, etc. And then maybe come back and do the next thing later. Um, hopefully if you have enough time to do that. So plowing ahead here, <clears throat> we're actually going to work through these examples, calculations and all. So uh, going back through this example, reminding you that non-parallel lines mean dependence, parallel lines mean independence in a stacked bar chart or something that's like a stacked bar chart. And then remembering that the two-way chi-square, this is what it tells us. It tells us about strength of association. Um, but more than that, it tells us whether the strength of association is strong enough that it would be unlikely to have happened if the null hypothesis were true. So it's going to give us a p-value. So let's see how we do that. We use this contingency table of frequencies here. It's a two-way frequency table, and we use that to calculate our chi-square statistic. We look in a chi-square table to figure out a critical value. We calculate degrees of freedom, which is super easy. And then if our chi-square observed that we looked up in that table is greater than the chi-square critical that we calculated from our data, then we know that p is less than alpha and we reject the null hypothesis. So I hope you can see how this is very similar to a lot of the other things that we've done so far. It's a really similar hypothesis testing situation to some other things. Here's the formula. It looks exactly the same as the other formula, doesn't it? It's the same as the goodness of fit test formula. It's just that you'll do it on more cells. That's all. So the mathematics of this will be very easy if you can do the chi-square goodness of fit. They won't be much different at all. But figuring out the expected values, the, those E's in the formula, is a little bit more complicated, but there's a simple formula for that too. It's not difficult, it's just maybe a, a, another detail to remember. And yeah, stats is details all the way down. So let's work through an example here. Let's say the juvenile justice city system in a large city offers some educational programs to at-risk youth, and we want to know whether those programs are equally effective. So do they have any differential effect on youth crime? Because the whole point is to reduce youth crime, right? So we can count how many youths uh, committed crimes after coming out of each of those programs, for instance, and we can use that to estimate how effective they are. Another way to think of that is, is the particular educational program related to or associated with later commission of crime. That's equivalent to what was said in the first paragraph. Also equivalent is using dependency language. You can say, does later criminal activity depend on which educational program a particular at-risk youth was enrolled in? Let's say alpha is 0.01, because we're going to have a really gigantic N. Our null hypothesis is independence. So it's the chi-square test of independence. And as I mentioned, for goodness of fit, uh, independence is the null hypothesis, so the name of the test is usually the null hypothesis that the test uh, deals with. And the alternative hypothesis, not independent. Dependent, you could say, or associated, either of those is fine. I chose to go with not independent. It's fine too. So here's the data. You've, the reason we have to use a chi-square test and we can't use an ANOVA on this is because this variable, number of crimes, is not numerical. It was collected in such a way that it's not numerical. Now, if it was collected where you just counted the number of crimes each youth committed, then you could do an ANOVA. You could have a mean for program A, mean, of, mean number of crimes of kids from program A, mean number of crimes from program B, do an analysis of variance, see if the means are significantly different from each other. Well, you can't do that because of this little guy right here greater than one crime. That's an open-ended category. That person could have committed two crimes or three crimes or 500 crimes, and there's no way to tell. So this is no longer a numerical variable. Now it's ordered categories. It's an ordered categorical variable. So we have to use categorical data analysis techniques for it, like this uh, analysis, this um, chi-squared independence test. So putting up our research question here again, let's look at the data. Program A we have 122, 70, and 8. Program B, we have another a different distribution. So you can see that the distributions are a little bit different. Not radically different, perhaps. It might be kind of hard to tell from that which of these programs is going to give you, is going to be um, significantly different from the others. It, so, of course, we have to, that's why we have to do the chi-square. And you'll notice that we have the column totals, the row totals. I hope you remember how to do that. That's one of the reasons why we talked about that back when we did that portion of our 
our class. Now we can graph this in two ways. Anytime we have a two-way contingency table, you can take the first variable and make the values of that variable the axis values, and then the, the values of the other variable form the clusters of the bars, or you can do it the other way around. So I'll show you both, and it can be handy. And let's do our eyeballing of the lines to see if we can get an idea of whether we think there's going to be dependence or independence, or how much, because we're looking for parallel lines or non-parallel lines. So we can connect the tops of the dark red bars, the no crimes bars, and then we can look at the frequencies across, so no crimes across all the programs, no or one crime across the programs. Those really don't look parallel to me at all. That is really not parallel. It looks like the face of a bird or something. And then one crime. Now it's not whether they're at the same level, it's whether they're parallel. They can be at different places on the graph as long as they're parallel, and that would still mean no association, because association is about parallel, and it's not about position. It's looking association-y to me. We could connect the lines the other way, too. We could connect the lines within groups. Could just make lines across the tops of each of the bar groups. And those don't look very parallel to me either. A little more than the other ones, but it's giving you the same information just in a different way. Now we, let's do the graph the other way. Let's put the number of crimes on the axis and then let's look at the programs uh, as clusters. So each, um, yeah, all the programs are clustered for each number of crimes. And we can draw our lines here too. So let's do the lines across the tops of those orangey red bars, the green bars, the teal bars, and the purple bars. Yeah, there's some significant deviations from parallel, although they are kind of all going in the same direction, more or less. So, there we go. And now we can look at within the clusters here. Yeah, those two really are not parallel. The question is, are they enough non-parallel that we will reject the null hypothesis? Are they is there enough association here that we can trust that there's an association in the population? So computing this, we're going to use this formula here. And the E is the expected frequencies. Now let's talk about the details of how you find that E. The expected frequencies are found from your data itself. And that means you actually have to have frequencies. Every once in a while you'll get a problem where you don't actually have frequencies. You have some proportions or some percentages or something like that. If that's the case, then you have to go fix that. You have to work out what the frequencies would have been. But most of the time you'll just have the frequencies because it's easy to just get the numbers. So figuring out these expected frequencies, that's the formula. The expected frequency for the value at row i column j is the row i total, the, the total for that row that that value is in times the, co the total for the column that that value is in divided by n for the entire study. So let's just take some fake quick data here. Um, let's say we have a variable a with three values with three levels, a variable b with four levels. What about this number here, this two? What's the uh, expected value that should go in that cell? The observed value is two. What should the expected value be? Well, the row total times the column total divided by n for the entire study. n for the whole study is 30. You can see that down in the corner here. So if you add up all these things in here, you get 30. These are the row totals. Those are the column totals. So the row total for this is 9, and the column total is 7. So to figure out the uh, expected value for that cell, for A2, B3, it's 9 times 7 divided by 30. The row total times the column total divided by 30. So that equals 2.1. So the expected value for that cell is 2.1. So let's take a different one. Let's A1, B4. There are five observations who had that combination. Five observations who had, you know, option one on variable A and option four on variable B, whatever those were, fell into those categories. What's the expected value there? What's going to be six times 18 divided by 30? So it's going to be 3.6. That's how you figure out the expected values. So let's go back to our actual data and let's look at our observed frequencies again. Our observed frequencies are just our data. Now the bold is not really part of the table. That's the margins. The margins, you don't do extra calculations on them. They're just, just there to tell you things. But we need those for the expected values. Let's calculate expected values. So here we go, expected frequencies for this cell, 122, it's 200 
times 461 divided by 797, and that'll give you that. For this, this had a 70 as an actual value, an observed value, but the expected value was 73.27. That's 200 times 292 divided by 797, etc. So we can do that for all of those values. We can apply that formula. That would have taken you five or ten minutes to calculate all that stuff. It's kind of a pain, but it's not difficult. It's just tedious. So what those expected values are, those expected values are saying, if you had this amount of data, if these number of observations, and if you had the distribution like this, if there were, you know, 200 answers here, and 195 here, and 203 here, and if you had this distribution across this variable, the expected values tell you the one possibility that the frequencies could have to have these values in the margins and no association between the two variables. So that's the expected values according to the null hypothesis if there was no association but if you still had these same values in the margins. So let's figure out the chi-squared components and that's every observed value minus its expected value squared. So this first one 122 minus 115.68 uh, and it's going to be kind of a small number. You square that and divide it by 115.68 and you get 0.34. So those are the chi-squared components. You do that for each one of those things, you add all those things up, you get 54. The degrees of freedom is the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. Four rows, three columns, three times two is six. So this is, you're going to evaluate this 54 and say is that big enough? And so you just have to find the chi-square distribution with six degrees of freedom. So you look in the table in the back of your book, or if you're me, you make a pretty picture using R. Uh, so I had to carry this out really far because 54 is a huge number. So our chi-square critical was um, with six degrees of freedom, because this whole distribution is six degrees of freedom, was 16.81. So we needed something bigger than 16.81, and that's alpha of 0.05. Well, we got something much bigger than 16.81. We got 54. So yes, we reject the null hypothesis. P is less than 0 0.00, lots of zeros, and a, one, and a one, or some number out there. So our critical value, et cetera, we reject the null hypothesis because P is less than alpha, and the conclusion is the two variables are not independent. The pattern of commission of crime after being in the programs does depend on which program you attended. So the next step would be to calculate uh, exactly where those differences are occurring. You'd probably want to see maybe differences between one crime and zero crimes, but also maybe differences between program A and program B or program B and program C, that sort of thing. You'd break down that contingency table into smaller sub-tables and you'd analyze them as necessary. It might, if it's an entire row or an entire column, you might analyze it using a chi-square goodness of fit test. If it's just two cells next to each other or two cells in general, then you can uh, analyze them using a proportion test. So you would break that down piece by piece and until you figured out what you wanted to know about the relationships and made estimates about what's going on in the population there. Let's do another example. Let's say there's a survey of whether people think buying firearms should be, re should, uh, whether people think that people buying firearms should be required to undergo a background check. And let's say in this survey there were a hundred people, men and women, fake and made up data. And then maybe this is the result that you found here. So the question is, is there an association? So you have enough information, go ahead and figure this out. I think I might have used alpha as 0.05. So if you, if you want to just get some practice, work this all out on your own. Figure out the answer. Uh, I can't remember if it's alpha of 0.05 or 0.01. Figure it out both ways, just to be sure. And it's probably 0.05 though. And then come back and watch the rest of the video. But I'm going to move on here. So the null hypothesis here is that these two variables are independent. So support for background checks is independent of sex. And the alternative hypothesis is that it's not independent, that there's an association between sex and support for background checks. So we can graph the data we found here. We're just taking this two-way table here and graphing that data. And again, we can graph it in one of two ways. We can graph it with one variable on the axis and the other in, in clusters or vice versa. Let's look at both just for practice of it. I would only probably only do one in real life, but sometimes I try both because one isn't pretty enough for me. And because one doesn't really help me understand the data well, so, so sometimes I do multiple graphs. So here we go. Yeah, this should be making sense here. This is looking good to me. Let's see, connect the tops of the same colors of bars. 
maybe those are kind of parallel. Not really, but it's not like they're reversals of each other or anything. Let's connect the tops with in-groups. Yeah, I mean, not technically parallel, but the question is, we're trying to guess when we look at this, is it non-parallel enough that we think it's reflecting non-parallel in the population too? I don't know. Let's do the other graph. Let's flip it this way. Now well, that's not very parallel, and that's really not parallel. So, I don't know, maybe we'll find something. Uh, there's definitely probable cause to keep uh, suspecting that something's going to go on here. So, looking at the data here, here's our observed values. And I'm going to show the expected values, so if you're calculating, you might want to pause. So, the expected values are going to be, so for instance, 40 times 50 is 900 sorry, <laughs> 2,000, divided by um, 100, so that's going to be 20, etc. So our expected values are pretty predictable here. We use the expected value formula to the expected frequency formula to figure that out. And like I did last time, I'm just going to have a whole other table to put the uh, chi-square components in. I add those up. And I get a chi-square of 2.07. That's my chi-square observed value. The degrees of freedom is 2. Three rows, two columns, so it's two times one is two. And so here's the distribution, and here's what things look like. Our alpha was 0 0.05 with a chi-square critical of four, an alpha level of 0 0.01 of 16.81. We're nowhere near that. Our chi-squared is two. So our p-value is gigantic. It's 0.36. It's much greater than 0 0.05. Actually, that shouldn't say 0 0.05. That should say 0 0.01 because it's right there. Anyway, it's much greater than 0 0.01. So we failed to reject the null hypothesis. So the evidence did not suggest that there's any association. The evidence suggests independence. The evidence con is consistent with the null hypothesis of independence, that the pattern of support for firearms regulation is independent from a person's sex. And since that omnibus test was not significant, we would not follow up with any other tests. We'd just say we're done. There's nothing to find here. So our final example here, I think it's our final example, it comes from the Monitoring the Future study. I looked at two variables, and I just, this, these data are in your, uh, well, in the data set that's on, on the website. You can use that if you need to, and if you want to do this by computer. So one question that the kids in this study were asked, these were middle school kids, I believe, was how important is it to have a lot of money? And the other one is, do you think most people would take advantage of you if they had the chance, or would they try to be fair? Now, I figured there would be an association. I thought this was an interesting thing to look at, because I thought the cynicism and the money thing would go together. So, we'll see. The null hypothesis is that, they, that one of those variables, the expectation of fairness in others, is independent of the other variable, the independent, the subjective importance of money. Now, this is a chi-square, because these were not married, measured numerically. They were measured on sort of Likert scale type things. And they're categorical. And then the alternative hypothesis is that the expectation of fairness does depend on or is associated with the subjective importance of money. And here's the data. I made a, a contingency table out of the data. I just used SPSS or something to create this contingency table. So if they had the chance, people would take advantage of you, I don't know, or try to be fair. So those are three categories. And then this one, how important is money to you? Not important at all, somewhat important, quite important, or extremely important. So you have these 12 different um, bins here, and then these are the numbers of individuals of students who answered in those combinations across those variables. So we want to see if there's an association here. And you can see we've got the row and the column and the total totals there. I graphed these things here. I'll just let you ponder the graph, and then I'll show you the lines. Yeah, kind of? Parallel, maybe? That looks pretty similar. It's like three little fish hooks there. The last fish hook has a bend on the end that the other ones don't. I don't know. Maybe. Let's find out. But I graphed it the other way, too. Same data, graphed in a different way. Those, there's some parallelness there. They're all kind of clawing out in the same direction. And those look kind of parallel. Actually, it looks like a slinky in stop motion. Yeah, I can't really tell. They're not totally parallel. And so that slight deviation from parallelness in an N of thousands could definitely mean that we reject the null hypothesis. Because that, don't, don't discount sample size. Sample size makes a big, big difference in all hypothesis tests. So let's just 
run it through. There's almost 2,400 uh, observations. That's a huge number. So here's our observed frequencies. Now let's do the expected frequencies to put into that formula later. The expected frequencies, you have to do the multiplication, like 146 times 1054 divided by 2399, etc. It would be a pain to do this. The degrees of freedom is going to be 6, because it's 3 rows times 2 columns, so 4 rows minus 1 times 3 minus 1, so it's going to be 6. And here's the chi-square components. Using the table from the previous slide, I'm working this through, the chi-square components. And we're just going to add up all these chi-square components. These are all the observed minus expected deviations squared divided by the expected for that particular cell, the expected value. And when you add them up, you end up with 16.26. I admit I'm kind of surprised. I thought it would be bigger. I thought the deviations would be bigger. So it was close, but I don't think we reject the null hypothesis here. Alpha is 0.01, and chi-square critical is for 6 degrees of freedom, 16.81. But our p-value is 0.012, slightly larger than 0.01. Oh, if only we had chosen alpha is 0.05. Too late. You can't go back and choose again. So our chi-squared observed is not greater than our chi-squared critical, so we will not reject the null hypothesis here. P is greater than alpha. We fail to reject the null hypothesis, so our conclusion, the pattern of expect, expectation of fairness in others does not seem to depend on the importance of money to a particular student. We don't do anything else because we didn't reject the null hypothesis with that um, omnibus test. So let's talk about what kind of skills you should be able to take home to pass exams and be an amazing data person in real life. Very important, you need to be able to recognize the data and recognize the question set up and do the right test when the time comes. And then, and then once you do that, you need to be able to set it up correctly, get the, get the data in the proper format, make sure it's all frequencies, not proportions, get it into that two-way um, contingency table correctly. Uh, you need to be able to state your null and alternative hypotheses correctly and find up the degrees of freedom and look up the critical value correctly. And then once you've got it all set up, you need to perform the calculations right, and there are a million little ways to go wrong. Although, like I say, I've had students who really don't mind chi-square because once you kind of get it, it kind of clicks and it can be one of the more enjoyable tests and less, less intimidating tests. And then this is totally critical. What do you do at the end? Do you, what, what do you do to determine whether you reject or retain the null hypothesis? What do those hypotheses even mean? If you reject it, what does that mean? How do you apply that to the research question? If you don't reject it, what does that mean? Those are always going to be worth more points than the calculation on any test or any homework. Because understanding your data is much more important than being a human calculator, in my opinion. So anyway, I think we're all done, except I might put some extra resources for practicing calculating some things online. But we're done with the lectures, and I will see you in class.